Welcome to the Radical Parenting Podcast. My name is Tony Shawcross. And I'm Kara Porva. I've got a special guest here. His name's Arlo. Uh, he's helping me. <laughs> As is his grandma. Hi, he might not be too cooperative, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we are, um, mainly talking about Peter Gray. Our research for this week's episode started with a podcast Kara sent me. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the description. Uh, it's the education research reading room number 38, Peter Gray on freedom to learn. And he pretty much just summarizes in like a one hour podcast, uh, the book that Kara and I then went on to read, which is, um, free to learn. Yeah. And we also referenced Peter Gray in one of our earlier episodes the one about the Batman podcast. So he's the guy, he's an evolutionary educational psychologist, no, evolutionary developmental psychologist, and he writes a column for psychology today. So there's some, a few links um, to him in that episode. Right. So this is the main book Karen and I read for this week's episode, Free to Learn by Peter Gray. I also read a book called Summer Hill by A.S. Neal, I view it as really, really similar as free to learn. Free to learn is like way more into the data and the and the science behind why this kind of like unschooling approach works. Summerhill is way more just philosophical and a little bit more anecdotal, um, but they really say the same the same thing. And they're both really radical books, if you if you ask me. They're 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 a pretty radical approach to to educating our kids and really steeped in the same. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know, Kara and I are really into books that that are about respect for your children and letting your children build their own confidence and find their own path. And uh, these books take that to, to the extreme with, with education. Yeah, I found it radical too. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of blowing my mind, um, not just thinking about my daughter's education, but also as a teacher. I mean, I'm a teacher. I'm a musician, you know, a classical musician. And a music teacher and yeah it's pretty radical stuff one of the other trainers introduced me also to um she's what's his name john holt um and his books uh are around the same period and you know very similar similar messaging so i think there's a lot of people that are on this bandwagon but it still really hasn't become the norm by any means yeah not at all and yeah, you were talking about it. Like, if you were to leave your music education to kids who were not being compelled by their parents to do it, but just like they're internally driven to do it, you'd lose like ninety some percent of your of your client base, right? It's possible. I mean, I hope not, but it, that's the thing. It's kind of hard to tell, right? So when the adults are all super involved, and the parents think it's my job to like have these experiences provide these experiences for my kids and then as the teacher I think okay it's my job as the teacher and as the adult or as the professional to um, provide information and experiences and stuff it's sort of this top-down approach of like you know I think I can still do my job and I'm experimenting with some different ways of making it more self-directed for my students You know, I think what it really comes down to is when when education becomes so top down, you know, the student, even if they started out with their own intrinsic motivation, maybe there's a student who was like begging to play the violin, was begging for lessons. Right. And then if it becomes a thing where they don't have a lot of choice, where their their impulses and questions and interest is not being followed if it's my curriculum or my process as a teacher and I'm like here this is the way you do it and do it this way then they will quickly lose their their motivation Mm -hmm. to play or do it because they're motivated to get your approval or get their parents approval or whatever which is yeah what what Peter Gray is pushing for uh, is pushing against you know it didn't work for some kids. It didn't work for his son, and that's how he got into this um, this field. But um, 
But even for the kids that it does work for, you don't really want your kid motivated by pleasing you and pleasing pleasing their teachers and pleasing, you know, others. You want them motivated by their intrinsic joy and motivation. So, yeah, I'm really psyched about the this, this school that he talks about and, and, and psyched about reading about Summerhill and to, psyched to know that there are these schools that really don't even have a curriculum. I've done a lot of work for local Montessori schools here in town, and I'm, I'm really impressed with, with the self-guided nature of the Montessori schools. But, um, but uh, as Peter says in his book, you know, even those still have a curriculum. They still have to uh, train to standardize tests and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, yeah, but the point, the point is, is that he believes and, and, and he has data that proves that if kids need to learn math for their profession, they will learn it. If kids need to learn physics for their profession, they'll catch up and they'll, and they'll learn it. Uh, they don't need to be like kind of force fed that. And, and, and in the traditional school system where kids are force fed that they don't really learn it. They don't really remember it. They don't really apply it. Um, they don't really enjoy it. And, uh, and the cost of having a compulsory education system is in his opinion and and according to his data much much higher than the than the benefit <clears throat> so uh yeah i mean the book is just full of data and and again the messages are really the same from free to learn and from summerhill but uh summerhill doesn't have that that data backing it up those that are watching on video uh, i've got a little head peeping in every once in a while uh, but those of you that are listening probably can't hear him it's yeah. a little past his bedtime, but he's not cooperating he's coming to check tonight. It, check it out. Yeah. Go for it, Arlo. This wouldn't be the Radical Parenting Podcast otherwise if you went to bed on time. Right. So I, um, can we start with that whole discussion at the beginning of the book about hunter-gatherer culture? Yeah. So this kind of blew my mind. So Peter Gray started out as a biologist. He was like, a, I don't know if it was, evolutionary stuff but he when his son started having trouble in school because his son just absolutely refused to be coerced into being someplace for you know like six to eight hours a day where he was supposed to do what he was told and couldn't um you know explore what he wanted to explore he he just wouldn't do it and peter gray i love the whole anecdote at the beginning of the book it's like pretty hilarious he basically learned from his son like oh yeah school is basically prison for children it's it's mandatory it's compulsory it's you know he calls it forced education or coercive education which you know i think of myself as like a pretty radical person but i honestly have never thought about school that way my family was very into school i was like real book smart and did well in school and i always thought oh it's so great that we have like you know this public education that's available to everyone and it's the great equalizer and all that and i'm you know i'm really starting to see it differently i mean i was also before because i was not not i'm not excited about sending my my kid to public school and i doubt she'll ever go um but um you know he got into this whole educational thing because of his son who basically refused to go to school or at least to cooperate while he was there and um he goes into this whole history of how schools were developed that I just found so fascinating. So I don't know that much about hunter-gatherer culture, but he talks about it being really egalitarian, you know, based on sharing and um, that it was really a life of leisure that like hunter-gatherers had tons of free time. You know, they would work or do whatever survival tasks they needed to do for like a couple hours a day. And the rest of the time, they're relaxing or playing music or telling stories or doing craft work or you know and that children were really free to play to explore to run around to go off by themselves without adults that there was just all of this freedom and play and leisure and the reason why hunter gatherer culture matters is because pretty much all of the time that humans have evolved all of the evolution of our brains and the way our brains work and the way we learn to learn and the way we learn to socialize all of that happened while we were in while we were in hunter-gatherer cultures the agricultural kind of 
world and certainly the industrial, um, you know, era, um, is so recent. It's like the last like 1%, even the agricultural era is just like 1% of our, of our evolution as humans. Um, so yeah, like the, yeah, all the way that our brain was wired and evolved to learn um, came from hunter gatherers, and so that's why he studied uh, hunter gatherer culture and learned that they <clears throat> they really practice. <laughs> sorry, they really play. It's just the way they learned everything was just playing. They just naturally play, and they're free to do what they want. And they mimic their parents, and they mimic hunting, and they mimic gathering. And they mimic you know, whatever, fighting and caretaking and all the things that they need to learn. And um, children, yeah, left to their own devices are going to are going to learn what they need to learn. That's that's the point of the book and the point of the school that he um, that he uh, puts up as an example. Yeah, right. I mean, he talks about how with no effort, children learn everything they know to be a, a member, a full member of their culture with basically no effort and with no adult interference or guidance or i'm sure there is guidance in terms of if uh if a child is interested in something they can go to an adult and get some you know mentorship or whatever but you know when i think about this like think about kids learning language i mean they learn to speak by the age of two or three years old which is an incredibly complex task without even trying right just because it's immersion they're immersed in hearing the language all day, every day. And it just, they're not diagramming sentences. They're not like being taught in a structured way. They're just taking it in and grow and building the skill to do that. You know, and in the style of um, violin teaching and viola teaching that I do is based on a Japanese man named Dr. Suzuki. And, um, he had this idea that you could learn to play an instrument in the same way, which is probably the hunter gatherer way, right? It's like, you're just, it's immersion. You're around it, you're hearing it. It's part of your day. It's part of your culture. Everybody that you know does it and you learn, you do it too and you learn how to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it seems kind of obvious to me now that I'm thinking about it, but yeah, I never thought about that agriculture is only like 1% of our history we're, we're, we're designed in this whole other, for this whole other lifestyle, right? And he talks about, you know, with the advent of agriculture that suddenly there was private ownership of land, which then turns into this hierarchy of power that some people own land and some people don't. And that for agriculture to work, you like have to work really hard all day. And um, so there was this move from play to work as like the main value and that meant that for children who were also working that that obedience and you know discipline and punishment punitive discipline became then the the dominant way that of how children were treated rather than being free to explore and play and learn that way so he talks about you know that suddenly play was thought to be like the enemy of of learning you know, that that education or learning was something that children had to be forced to do through, you know, through punishment and, and coercion. And um, I think a lot of that came from the sort of schools started out as religious institutions and they weren't so much about education as they were about obedience and hard work and sort of driving the sinfulness out of out of children and their sort of sinful willfulness was thought to be, you know, um, something to get rid of, to break the, that, that's the sinful will. So here, here's the quote that I want to read. So this is from chapter three. Success in farming generally depends on adhering to tried and true methods. Creativity is very risky. If a crop fails, a whole year's food supply may be lost. Farmers, unlike hunter-gatherers, don't regularly share food. So a family that loses its crop may starve. Moreover, farming societies are generally structured hierarchically, so obedience to those higher in wealth, rank, and power is essential to social and economic success. Thus, the ideal farmer is obedient, rule-abiding, and conservative. Farmers' strict discipline of children seems designed to cultivate those traits. In contrast, success in hunter-gathering 
requires continuous creative adaptation to the ever-changing, unpredictable conditions of nature. For hunter-gatherers, each day's food supply comes from the cumulative efforts of diverse individuals and teams, each foraging in their own chosen way and using their best judgment. The diversity of methods and sharing of food between all members of a band creates a hedge against a possibility that anyone will starve. Social success for the hunter-gatherer does not depend on obedience to anyone higher up, but upon the ability to assert one's thoughts and wishes effectively in the company of equals um, or negotiation and compromise, not threat and submission. Thus, the ideal hunter-gatherer is assertive, willful, creative, and willing to take risks. Hunter-gatherers' permissive parenting served well to foster those traits. And, and Peter Gray prefers the term trustful parenting rather than permissive parenting, which I really liked. Yeah, again, the, the idea is just that this is the way that our brains evolved. And some people think that that just doesn't work in today's society. But um, yeah, but the, the, that book and, and the Sudbury Valley uh, School, which is the school he uses as an example, um, as well as Summerhill, really demonstrate that it does still work for kids. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people that do believe in the like inherent sin of humans and of children and that we do need school and church and other things to like drive the sin out of them for the most part those people won't be listening to our podcast because yeah, right. none of the books yeah, and right. people that we follow and philosophies that we follow really buy into that approach this approach uh you know from janet lansbury to um to peter gray to all of the authors that we've been reviewing um they all believe that we are inherently good, that we're evolved to cooperate and evolved to be moral and <clears throat> evolved to collaborate with other humans. Um, and that if we just don't teach our kids to hate themselves and to feel shame and to feel, um, you know, that they aren't good enough, um, that we will help our kids, you know, grow into, into, into happy successful people that that make a positive impact in the world pretty radical yeah i mean there's just the the it's a very democratic space it's a democratic school so um the the students and the 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 faculty uh all get a vote the the students outnumber the 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 faculty by like um 15 to 1 or 20 to 1 or something like that so they all just get one vote they have to reelect all of the teachers and um and ad administration every year they have to come up with the rules and stuff every year um there's uh you know anywhere from like i think a little under 100 to maybe 150 students in any given year it's not really that expensive uh the kids are age 4 up to 17 and, um, you know, it's actually l lower tuition than most private schools. It's a private school, but it's, uh, it's a lower tuition than most private schools. And they just are free to kind of do what they want. You know, there's some certain rules for kids, that, you know, up to a certain age where they have to, if they wander off, be accompanied by another student or something like that. But uh, for the most part, the kids just totally self-organize and play at what they want to play at and uh, occasionally ask, you know, a curriculum uh, for not a curriculum, ask a, a teacher to teach them about something that they want to learn about. But the kids are totally in charge of the learning process. Yeah, it's really cool idea. And I don't think they don't even call them teachers. They're just like adult staff members who are basically there mostly for safety but who can also, you can ask them questions. And, um, you know, the anecdotes that he gives, gave are so cool in the book. This is where Peter Gray's son ended up, ended up going. And, um, you know, where it's like, you know, some of the more out there things are like, you know, a child can go and collect roadkill from the road outside of the school and dissect it and, you know, like, end up being a doctor or a mortician or whatever, you know, kids can play, play instruments, they can learn comp to code computers, they can do um, whatever they want, like truly. Um, 
and that they're in completely in charge of themselves. I just learned that Laura Poitras was uh, was an went to school there. That's the that's the filmmaker who made uh, the Citizen Four documentary. Yeah, there's got to be such cool people who graduated from that school and are doing really cool things. Because I mean, if you think about it, to actually love something that much that you are just you're just following your own natural impulse of being drawn towards something and being allowed to go as deep as you want to go into that and have help and support and resources, but really no pressure, no assignments, no grades. You're only studying something because you really, truly fascinated by it and, and get some kind of joy from, from learning about it, you know? And they aren't just artists and filmmakers. There's, there's like, uh, college math professors there's kind of people in all realms of right. of, of education very cool i there was one place in i think it was in chapter six where he uses the phrase the inhibitory effect of teaching which just like sort of crumpled me a little bit i'm like oh god what am i doing to my students totally ruining them by teaching them and lots of like <laughs> little little studies yeah where he like says like if if an experiment or a teacher like shows a kid how to work some toy um the kid will play with it less long or if they if they introduce it and maybe like leave some confusion for the kid the the more like that the kid has to figure out the longer the child will will play with the toy yes that same the squeaky toy experiment that i think you're talking about that really caught my attention because I think it was set up that in the play condition, sorry, I'll say that in the teaching condition, the, te the, the experimenter would like demonstrate the toy and say, this lever makes this noise or whatever. And the kid didn't play with the toy as long after that. And then in the other, the other condition was called the play condition. And the teacher just played with the toy as if they were playing with it and getting like deriving satisfaction from just messing around with it. And the kids in though that condition explored and and discovered new things that the teacher hadn't demonstrated. And I thought, my God, I could just do this in all of my lessons. I could like not teach my students anything. I could just play like as if I was just playing music for the joy of it. And they might actually learn more than if I was like, you got to play these scales and you got to do this or that. And you got to like hold your hand this way and stuff and um it, yeah it's a totally different completely different headspace for teachers yeah uh what were some of the other studies they were, that part was really interesting he said that interest in science uh across schools like across the united states just drops uh over time except for in these democratic schools where kids are only following science if they're interested in it he also said that it showed talked about a few studies that show that evaluation really of any kind it improves the performance of those who are skilled but diminishes performance of those who are who are less skilled um yeah so people who are already going to do well do better with the whole grading realm and those who aren't going to do well do worse when they're being evaluated and graded. I was just, I was just going to say, you know, it's sad to see how much, how much schools are all about grades and assessments and testing and, and the kids, they, they buy into it, you know, and there's, there's really not a lot of learning happening. You know, it's like kids learn how to, this is where John Holt really like uh, hits the nail on the head in some of his books, where it's like in school, kids don't learn what they're, what they learn is how to manufacture the correct answer that the teacher is lo looking for and to jump through the right hoops to get the grade or the whatever it is that they need. And then it's not actually about real deep understanding and, and learning from a place of curiosity and exploration and and something that's useful in your daily life, right? I have a really good quote about this too. Um, it says, he says in chapter four, one of the tragedies of our system of schooling is that it teaches students that life is a series of hoops that one must get through by one means or another. 
and that success lies in other people's judgments rather than in real self-satisfying accomplishments. Students learn that their own ideas and questions don't count. What counts is the ability to provide the correct answers to questions they did not ask and that do not interest them. Not necessarily answers that the student really understands or cares about or believes are correct or finds useful in daily life. Yeah, I'll do, I'll read another one. So he says, uh, we force kids to learn math that they will never need to use and that they will largely forget by the time they might need to use it. Even the best students simply say that they're good at jumping through those hoops, not that they've found their passion. It's definitely what I was up to in school, you know. I was always just like path of least resistance, get the best grades that I could, but it was rare that I ever studied anything that I cared about. Right, and that's what we're actually teaching is like do the least amount of effort to get the required, you know, grade or, or gold star or whatever. And it, it's not about following your passion or finding your passion or anything. For me, it was music, you know, like I did all my school stuff and just did – as, as little as possible. Um, and in, for me, music was it. That's the thing I wanted to be doing, right? Um, oh, there there's another experiment he talks about um, that comes from Alfie Cohn. So we 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 talked about another book by Alfie Cohn, Unconditional Parenting, but one of one of his like major foundational books that has really influenced people is called Punished by Rewards. And it's just like, so chock full of research about how um, rewards are just as bad as punishments, that it, they're all, there's two sides to the same coin, right? And that rewards um, really, you know, like good grades or teacher approval or whatever, that they really take away the desire to learn and understand. It takes, it actually destroys intrinsic motivation. And the, the experiment that they, one of the famous ones that I remember is, I think it was called, I don't know if it was children or what, they were asked to draw or something like that. And some of them received a reward and some of them didn't. The ones who received a reward then went on to draw, spend less time drawing and to do less creative artwork as judged by somebody, I don't know. And without even knowing what was happening, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? It's like when you pay somebody, then suddenly it becomes work instead of play, you know? So Peter Gray is saying that when when children are actually playing, they're learning. As soon as it becomes work, that's another big part of the free education thing is um, that children learn better in mixed ages. The children don't always learn the best, don't ever learn the best, actually being in a group with only kids of their own age, that that's not a great way for kids to learn, to be uh, segregated with just their peers of exactly the same age. Um, I went on a little bunny trail there, Tony, save well, it's, us. It's obvious why, yeah, why mixing ages is good for kids who are younger, because they get challenged by the by the older kids. But um, it also helps the older kids <clears throat> um, just build kind of more empathy and, and, and support and kind of nurturing. Um, and yeah, there was some data around like how often when asked older kids just voluntarily offered help to, to younger kids, it was, you know, incredibly high percentage of the time. So um yeah, I mean, I, I still am of the opinion that, and this isn't really in any of these books, but with Arlo, I'm still constantly reading these little, these little books about, um, you know, like learning facial expressions. Where's the sad baby? You know, where's the angry baby? And then at the end, like, can you make these these faces yourself? Oh wow! For me, it's mixing in just like a lot of like. Um, awareness of of emotions and consideration. What, why I'm mentioning that is because yeah, I don't think we need to be sp socializing kids in the way that we that we think we need to. We just we just I just want Arlo to be considering other people's feelings, and I think if he is practiced at considering other people's feelings, he's going to make all the right decisions. Yeah, and P Peter Gray talks a lot about how kids 
kind of socialize each other. Because if you're playing a game with people and you're interested in keep playing that game and you can't agree on the rules and somebody leaves the game, like everybody loses. So that there's this natural socialization that happens when kids play together um, because they do have the impulse to play together and they don't want somebody to to just just leave the game. And um, yeah, that's so cool. So here's what I, here's my dilemma as a teacher. Like I can see how wonderful it is for kids to learn from each other in mixed age settings. And if an older child knows how to do something that you want to be able to do, they can show you. It's great for the younger child to be with someone who has a higher skill set. And it's great for the older child to sort of have this like ownership and like authority and, and the meaningfulness of like, I like can do something that's interesting to someone else and I know how to do it and I'm good at it. And um, I just wonder how can adults do that also? And maybe it just doesn't work because adults are in this position of authority but I'm like, because I do think, you know, as a musician, um, I don't actually see how someone teaches themselves to play the violin. I think it's totally possible, but they're going to need like books and YouTube videos and stuff, right? Like they're probably not going to learn how to play the Bach A minor concerto, like in a closet in isolation. It's not going to happen, right? Like there is cultural transmission, right? I mean, that's Peter Gray's definition. Education is cultural transmission. So how do I transmit this tradition that I love? I love classical music. It's beautiful to me. I love it more than any other kind of music. And there's this whole tradition around it that I do want to be able to pass on to the next generation. And how do I do that without being an authority figure who dampens the 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 exploration or the the curiosity or the intrinsic motivation of a child who also loves classical music because many of them do believe believe it or not yeah i think that the answer peter gray would give is you wait until you're asked um i don't know if that's a good a good answer for you but there's a local yeah. musician here in town named josh novak who um whose like dad gave him a guitar and he had no cultural information passed down. All he had was him and a guitar in a room and just totally learned it. And what's amazing too is he's uh, he's left-handed. Um, he was given a right-handed guitar, but uh, didn't know the difference. And so he still just naturally played it left-handed. So the mm -hmm. strings are all upside mm -hmm. down. So his Whoa. his chords are all like so out of whack because... He, he just never learned any chords uh, and he still today plays a right-handed guitar upside down. Uh, so all oh, this, wow. all the strings are in reverse order. So yeah, I mean, we can do it. And he's a, he, that's all he does for a living is make music. So, wow. and he has a unique yeah. sound and unique chord structures and unique, unique, uh, you know, voicings yeah. and, and everything. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a little bit in the classical music world. There's a little bit too much, like right way to do it you know um that we could we could do with a little less of that you know what i've been doing lately the last couple of weeks while we've been reading these books is when my students come to their lessons well we're meeting on zoom right now i ask them what do you want to play for me today what do you want to work on because normally i'm like running the lesson right i'm like okay well here's your assignments from last week let's start at the beginning and go through them and like, even I get bored with it, you know, we like do, they're doing the same thing every time. So yeah, lately I've been sort of like throwing out the rule book and just being like, you know, I'm sort of firing myself from my own job. You know, my students will play for me and I'll say like, you know, what do you think? How's it going? What do you want to work on? What do you, we, what do you want to get better at? What sounds awesome to you? What, what doesn't quite sound the way you want it to sound? And um, it does work better if they're like, well, you know, this one measure, like I just can't quite get it to sound how I want it to sound. Then I can be like, oh, here's something that might be helpful. And they actually can take it and use it, right? Instead of me saying, 
So in this one measure, you were out of tune and you might try doing this with your hands or your pinky is blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, uh, so again, we will provide the, the link to uh, the Education Research Reading Room um, podcast. I do recommend listening to it. Uh, listening to Peter Gray's uh, uh, book or reading it takes, you know, eight, 12 hours, whatever. But it's a great one hour kind of summary of kind of uh, really everything that's in the book is really well summarized in that podcast. I think it's like two hours, actually, but it's pretty rad. I mean, I found it a very easy listen. I didn't think I was going to make it all the way, and then I absolutely couldn't put it down. I loved it. I also really highly recommend uh, Summerhill by S. Neil. I found it so inspiring and so radical. It's There's such great companion books, uh, in my opinion, uh, and, then, and then John Holt as well. Uh, so free to learn is the the book that we read, and let's let's talk a little bit more about a couple of the other um, kind of chapters and sections of well, free to learn. So he really gets into playfulness and how that that is how we're wired to learn. That that's how children learn. You know, he talks about the playful state of mind. Um, here's here's the five characteristics of play that he talks about. Play is Number one, self-chosen and self-directed. So he talks about even in school, when teachers do something that they think is playful, the kids don't label it as play because they didn't choose it themselves. So, um, and then number two, in play, means are more of more value than ends. So in play, it's all about the process. It's not about being efficient or like getting the right answer even or anything it's like let's take the long route around because we're just like exploring and 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 really deeply going into this thing for the pleasure of it um play is number three um has structure or rules that are not physically necessary but emanate from the minds of the players and so, you know, there's like actual games or songs or things that have structure to them. It's not just chaos, right? Um, number four, play is imaginative, non-literal, somehow removed from serious life. And then number five, play requires an active, alert, but non-stressed frame of mind. So these are points for me to ponder as a teacher, right? Is like, I do think I'm probably going to keep being a teacher, even though if I like completely um, sign on to all of this philosophy, then perhaps I should quit my job. But like, I think there's a way for adults to get involved here and be truly playful um, where, you know, it's not, it's like a my it's like flipping a switch for me in my mind of like, oh, hard work does not equal learning play equals learning i'm going to give a couple of personal anecdotes um first is i went through school i was really good at just kind of minimizing effort and maximizing re rewards because the for me the goal wasn't learning it was just getting the good grades so i was able to kind of not put in a lot of time and effort into school still get the okay grades and then um got the job that i thought i sh i wanted when i got out of <clears throat> out of college. Um, I got laid off from that job in 2000 when the dot-com crunch happened in 2000 and ended up starting my own my own nonprofit just deciding like what do I want to do with my with my life? I can do anything right now. What do I want to do? And at you know 23 or 24 however old I was I just thought like I want to keep doing this kind of advertising creative communications work but I want to do it for social change organizations a lot is changing with the internet. There might be a huge opportunity to kind of shift how we shape our public awareness and how we shape public policy and kind of make, make the world a little bit more democratic and representative of people who don't have a lot of money. Um, and so I started this kind of like ad agency for nonprofits. And so every uh, month or so, we would go and produce a promotional video or a website or something for a different nonprofit. And this is I had just, you know, gotten pretty clear that this is what I want to devote my life to. And, uh, and it's a great job because every month I get to steep myself in like the, 
the thoughts of like the Audubon Society and understand their philosophy and then teach people about birds and then uh, make a video or a website that helps people understand Montessori schools or helps people understand whatever. And the first, the first time I ever thought like, wow, maybe this would be a better way to like make the world a better place was when I was working with, with a Montessori school. And I was just like, shifting the education system is so important. And so I do think, yeah, that you should, you should stick with it, but yeah, evolve, evolve the way that you're doing it. I had another personal anecdote I wanted to share. So my job too, when I started it, it was both about the change I wanted to make in the world, but also just what I wanted to do every day. It's like, I love making mm -hmm. videos. I love making, you know, graphic design. I love art. So you were playing, you were like designing a life of play for yourself. And for at least five years, when I started that organization, I was doing pretty much every day exactly what I would be doing if there was no money, no jobs, no nothing. I was just doing what I love doing every day. And at some point, the tasks weren't changing that much, but my approach to them was, you know, it started becoming my job, you know. And, and it's not that I stopped enjoying it, but I started relating to it as work. And I Damn, remember, Alfie Cohn. That's like Alfie Cohn. Reward, reward, punished, punished by, by rewards. rewards. Yeah, which I don't think yeah. that was even a children's book. Yeah, I think that book was actually more about like managers and, and business and whatnot. Um, but I remember once I, I started like realizing like, okay, I'm not liking my job anymore. This is what I wanted to do. And I would go in seven days a week because I just love, it's just what I wanted to do with my spare time and everything. And then I started realizing, like, I'm not liking this anymore. And so uh, a, a mentor of mine suggested that I list all the tasks that I do, track my time, all of it, and then rank each of them on, like, a scale of 1 to 10, how much I love it, how enjoyable it is, whatever. And when I first did that, like, this was 10 years ago, in isolation, when I was scoring each of those things, they were still, like, nines and tens i was still really enjoying all the stuff i was doing i just wow. was relating to it as like as like a an, a should obligation. Or, yeah, an obligation yeah and so i just right. had to like again shift my thinking and then again that didn't even last that long at all anything can become a rut after after a while and now my job is much less creative i'm i'm hardly ever this is the only thing i edit is this uh this uh I was complaining to Kara recently about with this new software that we're using, having to put in like six hours per episode in editing and, and, uh, and at the same time being like, oh, I kind of, I kind of like it actually. It's the only time I get to edit anymore. You secretly love it. Yeah. Yeah. The secret is play. The secret is that your, your work and your learning, uh, be based in play. And if you do that, it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like you're just like, not then contributing anything to the world. You know, I probably contributed more to the world in those first five years where I was just like here every single day at work, you know, working, you know, putting my heart and soul into it. I was probably contributing more to society uh, through that kind of play than any time when I'm just drudging through my 40 hours a week. Yeah. And I mean, the same could be said for anyone learning anything, right? Like if it's, if it's, a desire to just immerse yourself in the process for the joy of it, you know, you're going to learn so much more than if you like had this set sort of idea about where you were going to end up. Right. Yeah. I became a professional musician much the same way. It was kind of by accident. I had actually quit playing for a couple years after I graduated from like this really prestigious music school. I completely like put my viola in the closet for almost two years. I was going back to school for psychology. I, I wanted to be a therapist. And then while I was in school, I started gigging a little just to make some money. I started like playing with the local symphony. And then, you know, I just really enjoyed it. I liked it. And so I kept doing it and I did more and more and more of it until I was too busy. So I, I would go, I went down to part time in school or I would take a semester off. And then finally I just quit school altogether before I finished my degree and became a full-time musician. And I had had a couple years while I was still in school to sort of gradually build up this sort of freelance career that like I probably couldn't have designed even if I had tried, you know, I wouldn't have been like, I'm gonna move to Asheville, North Carolina and be a freelance musician. 
and I'll do play in this orchestra and do these like freelance gigs and teach some students. I, I had no concept that that lifestyle even like existed. And so just by like playing and doing what I actually loved, it kind of, I mean, it feels like it kind of felt in, in my lap. I mean, I felt really lucky and I would, I would, I would love for my child to have that experience of just being able to do what they love and follow that, that passion and, and have it lead wherever it leads. You know, you don't know where it's going to lead at the, at the beginning of it, you know, and I have this little voice that says like, well, they still have to be exposed to things like what if they love something that they never get a chance to be to experience right like i'm thinking at the sudbury valley school as cool as it sounds as much as i like want to move to vermont right now so my child can go to that school i'm like they probably don't have an orchestra there and how would you know that you wanted to play in an orchestra if you never got to play in an orchestra and you never had that experience that experience wasn't available to you and you have to study for like many years to even be good enough to play in an orchestra, right? So I, I it's like, I'm a little juggling those ideas in my head. It's Massachusetts, not Vermont. Oh, Massachusetts. <laughs> You'd think okay. it'd be Vermont, but. All right. <laughs> cool. uh, so the, uh, Peter Gray also has an article from Psychology Today that, that summarizes the seven sins of our, uh, system of force education. We'll put a link to that. I'm not going to go through each of the seven, but the first one, and what he says is that if we have a choice to teach children without coercion, without putting them in like a prison structure, making them do things they don't want to do, uh, if there's a way to, to do that, that also doesn't make them totally cynical about democracy because they grow up in this like environment that has no, you know, they have no voice. Uh, we, we have an obligation to figure out a way to do it. We can't deny them of their liberty um, just because they're young. And, and yeah. his school, Sudbury Valley and, and Summerhill and many other schools demonstrate that there is a way to do this. And everybody who's unschooling and homeschooling, there is a way to do this that doesn't um, deprive kids of their freedom and, and liberty. So, and yeah. that's pretty radical, right? I mean, because we all think, well, not all of us, but in general, most people think that a, education is like this positive force in people's lives, right? And it's like, he's saying it's unethical, like it's wrong. It's not okay to force children to go to school all day. And like, I get it because it's all about like, you can't speak without raising your hands. You can't talk to your friends except for like 20 minutes at lunch. You can't even talk to them at lunch if you're, someone in your class did something the teacher didn't like and you're on you know, the red chart or something. You can't go to the bathroom except for at certain points in time. You know, It's kind of crazy if you think about it. Mm -hmm. We had my neighbor, I'm sorry, I'm totally interrupting the seven sins, but we had my neighbor was over here for dinner tonight She's, she's maybe 10 or so, and she goes to this school that, you know, seemingly is lovely. And she was literally at the dinner table, raising her aunt hand, asking for permission to speak. And I was like, honey, you do not have to raise your hand. You can speak whenever you want to and say whatever you like, you know? And I mean, it's a little freaky when you think about it. Yeah. You know, kids are being indoctrinated in this way where it's, you know, stand in line, be silent, don't talk and do what you're told. And if you're not, there's like something wrong with you. Like you're a problem. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's too much for us to get into, but yeah, that's how we end up having kids that like think that they're ADD and ADHD. It's, it's in many cases, maybe they are in some cases. And in other cases it's that they're being forced to do something that human children aren't designed to do it's that they're being forced to sit there in this in silence in that way yeah yeah so i he said that he thinks you know and i hope he's right that in you know 10 or 20 years 30 years 40 years we're going to start viewing this kind of approach to education as totally antiquated that it doesn't work as well it's also totally immoral or unethical and i feel that way too all the books everything we're doing are all about honoring uh, our children and giving them, um, you know, as much free will and, and, and 
an opportunity to be their own guide as possible. And so this is just kind of the natural um, direction. So I've joined since uh, since reading these books. I've joined a few different um, unschooling communities on, on on Facebook. I don't even have uh, both. Karen and I are only have uh, joint custody of our of our kids. We we don't get to make these decisions entirely by ourselves. But um, to the extent I do, I'm going to be encouraging um, homeschooling and unschooling, uh, or at least schools that really um, abide by this kind of philosophy. Yeah, I don't know yet what's going to happen, what I'm going to do with my daughter. And I think that her dad pretty much let me decide, um, which is lovely. And she's at a Waldorf school right now in the early childhood program, which goes even in kindergarten. That's still part of early childhood where it's really free play almost the whole entire day. They have very short, like 15 minutes or so of circle time where they do some like songs or movements or little games and things and but in first grade they start with the curriculum so there's some very non-traditional things about the waldorf school you know it's it's a lot more holistic you know they do a lot of you know painting and moving and singing and you know verses and um you know your rhythm me is this like special movement thing they do and um i think there's a more appreciation of students as whole people you know, and they're still in a classroom with a teacher who is directing a certain curriculum and they're in a, a you know, single age situation. Um, you know, there still are assignments. There's no grades. That's really important to me. So, yeah, I have some decisions coming up about that, you know, whether to send her through Waldorf, the Waldorf curriculum or, you know, do some wild and crazy unschooling at yeah. home. Yeah. Since you, you're at that age, luckily I have a few years where we even have to figure it out. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to say before we wrap up uh, this episode? And again, we've th there's so much here, so we're just going to have to put links to the to the different books and 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 podcasts. Um, there's just there's yeah. just a wealth of information. I'm sure we're going to come back to it in the podcast yeah. as we read more. There's one little thing I want to say, which may be opening a can of worms, but I just, in the spirit of Peter Gray. I'm really fascinated by this idea, so I'm going to tell you. I have this dilemma where, you know, for many years I've been a teacher who has believed in intrinsic motivation and supposedly in self-directed learning, even though I don't think I was doing a great job of it. And so I kind of like, I, I sort of threw away some of the whole playfulness idea. It was really good for me to read all this about the the, about play in Peter Gray, because I had put it in my mind somehow that like, it's not my job to convince someone that like music is fun or playing an instrument is fun. I always thought it's up to the student to have a desire, to have a drive, to learn to play an instrument and to have some kind of natural love of music. And so I almost thought of, you know, play or you know doing games and all things i almost thought oh like they're the kind of these gimmicks that sort of trick children into doing something they wouldn't do otherwise so in a way i was almost kind of against being you know too much into the play and now i'm like man i was really going in the wrong direction you know because i've always been playful in terms of like my demeanor and doing making little games for for technique stuff and always like I love to use metaphors and images and things like that but I mean I could really I feel like my eyes have been open to like how much farther I could go like I could go way so much farther into the play yeah and I just thought well it's the child's job to love it already I can't do anything about that and I'm not gonna try yeah. you know what I'm what I'm saying totally yeah I I, I I'm I'm not a music educator. I'm I'm nowhere at Kara's level, but I have right. I have taught piano to to several kids and my approach always is just to make it as fun as possible as quick as possible. So I teach kids um just basic three three note chords. Um let them look up the songs, the pop songs or the video game theme songs or whatever that they love and just teach them the most simple three chords so that within like a lesson or two they can feel like they're they're having fun. 
um, because that's what it was for me. I never took a lesson. I never, I never, I never was trained. The first class I tried to take in college, I just like was like, okay, this is the last class I'm taking because they made me change my fingerings of everything, and my fingering was great. And the teacher even said that she's like, you're in some ways so much more advanced than any other student in this class, and in some ways so far behind every other student because you. You don't know how to read music well. Your fingerings are messed up. You know, whatever. Um, and uh, and I'm I mean I'm an awesome pianist. I just don't know how to yeah. do it the way that a classically trained pianist would 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 be. Yeah, but I was like on I had a live TV show where I would play right. play piano uh, on TV for four years. So I'm I'm capable of doing it, but uh, wow. in a very different in a very different way. So you're a professional musician. Yeah, I played also at the Cherry Creek Mall for a few years. That's such a good example, yeah. Tony. I mean, music is cool because like you can't fake it, right? Like you have to understand it on some level and actually being able to do it. You can't just like check the right box and get the right answer, right? Yeah. In some ways, people who teach themselves like you and who learn in the ways that is most meaningful to you so like you can do whatever you want in the kind of music that you want to play if you wanted to play Tchaikovsky's piano concerto you would probably teach yourself to read music and like learn the technique that you needed to learn to do that if you wanted to play that piece, yeah right yeah but you probably don't right you want to play other kinds of music yeah I'd really struggle to play it <laughs> that, for sure So then that's the thing so as a classical musician I can say like we're considered to be like some of the most highly trained musicians but in a way we're very handicapped like I'm a slave to the page I read music like a I'll try not to say the word I could sit down and sight read like any symphony that you put in front of me and I probably wouldn't be sight reading because I probably played it five times before with right. a professional orchestra. But like, I can't improvise to save my life, you know? Yeah. I mean, I could hear a song and, and pick it out and like, it might take me a while, right? But so it's funny, like the amount of training that we have means we can do certain things amazingly well and are just like completely stumped in other directions. Not everyone has this problem, some people, play in both worlds, you know, popular and classical and can improvise and read music. I'm not saying it's like a either or. And um, yeah, it's just such a good example, like of, of doing what is asking the questions that interest you and learning the things that are actually useful for what you want to do. You know? And like Kara also just said, like, if I really wanted to learn Tchaikovsky, I probably wouldn't be that much worse off than a lot of kids who have taken piano lessons. You know, like I could probably get there. Um, who knows? But Peter Gray's argument is like, yeah, if you end up needing calculus and you, um, you know, you're, you're at a, you know, at a senior level, 12th grade level of school, but never had the basic algebra and geometry and trigonometry that a lot of other kids have you'd think that you'd be so far behind, but the reality is that those kids that end up needing calculus um, are able to pick it up, you know, pretty quickly. He, one of the students that he, um, one of the graduates that he surveyed, uh, they surveyed like 80 graduates or something like that. Um, yeah, was a was a college uh, mathematics professor. So, uh, and, and he had never taken basic right. algebra or trig or geometry or whatever. And he just was interested yeah, in that. And so, so he or she learned uh, how to do all that. You know, he talks about the graduates from Sudbury Valley going on to college and doing really well and having like an amazing ability to deeply understand things and to be creative and be problem solvers and like that their critical thinking is sort of like way above what we normally would find. Yeah, and then even though, you know, people would think that they would struggle to, to work in a, in a structure like that, a structure like college, but, uh, you know, they seem to thrive because they chose that structure. This isn't imposed on them. I went to this school. I want to go to this college. I know that it has these structures. Um, and so, yeah, they relate to it very differently than if it was just imposed on them. Yeah. All right. Well, please check it out. Please check out um, Summerhill. Please check out Free to Learn. Learn a little bit more about the different schools. Uh, we'll put links to several of these things uh, and comments. Any other suggestions? I want to read more books and more authors that, that believe in this kind of work and read about unschooling. And I feel like we've opened up a can of worms that, that I'm really excited to, to pursue. Yeah, me too. Good. 
All right, that's way past this kid's bedtime, so I'm going to get up and uh, and yep. go put him to bed. But thank you again, Kara, for the recommendation, and and thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Tony. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.